L.A. wasn't an old city in the 40s and even 50s, and there were a lot fewer people here. The city was less polluted, and it wasn't as crowded, and the valley had farms. It's real easy to look back on that period with uh, nostalgia and, and a kind of longing. From, you know, 1950 to 1960, so much changed in the world, and really, in Hollywood, the old studio system was going to be gone forever. In the early 1950s, of course, the studio system was still in effect. It had been in effect for many, many years. Hollywood was run by and completely involved in primarily one industry, and that was making movies. A studio like MGM would probably make uh, one movie a week. They had people under contract, that not only the players, but the directors and the writers and the staff, and then there were full-time employees who went there every day. It was almost a village, in a sense then, a small, intimate kind of place where a lot of pride was taken in maintaining the image. A star and actor was a commodity, and the studios were driven in what they did for those actors simply because they were an investment. All the studios were factories. You were going to be something, and they were going to develop you and market you and distribute you. If you wanted to do a different movie somewhere else, you had to have permission. It was all controlled. You, you really had very little freedom. Many of the actors that they signed uh, had no experience, and so they would take them and train them, and train them not just in the ability to act or to say a line without flubbing it, but in how to walk, how to talk. They trained you to sing and dance and ride a horse, because if you can't we can't get full use out of you. What is it that you can act? People spoke differently then. You know, it was, there was this, it wasn't really an English accent, but it, it wasn't really an American accent. It was a slightly formal, affected accent. And the real Tony Mannix had that. She was from a showgirl from New Jersey. Tony Mannix was abroad with a lot of class or as she would say, it, Kloss. Diane uh, affects a slight, very subtle Eastern Seaboard accent because it was Hollywood's way to try to neutralize everybody and turn these people into Hollywood stars. You couldn't have some girl going, how y'all doing? You know, I mean, it just wouldn't work. Eddie's got a mistress, a Japanese girl, very sweet. An apartment in Brentwood, a cabin up in Big Bear. Diane did that accent, and we were worried because it can seem like bad acting. You know, whereas in fact, it's just a sort of proper way of speaking. I think she pulls it off beautifully. It's Harry Cohn's picture. Eddie's at MGM. Well, whatever happened to Honor Among Thieves? It was a complete kingdom, a system in which everything was under the control, the powerful control of the studio bosses. They would tell stars, you know, you don't, don't marry that person. You know, they would really try to control everything. A million dollar investment. You think I'm gonna let you fuck with that? You think you're gonna be a star? The control wasn't just over, you know, the image that's presented to the public. It was like of the police. They could cover up, you know, an actor got in a car accident, ran over an old lady, covered up. Eddie Mannix, that's what he did. They were the fixers, they fixed problems. When it comes to publicity, what's true or false really doesn't matter. If it hurts the studio, if it stops one person from buying a ticket, I have to fix it. That's my job. You know, the chief of police at MGM in those days was also the chief of police at, uh, I think, Culver City. I mean, the, there was no separation. The, the studios controlled the town. You didn't have to go and do that. The studio had a publicity department in every major city in the world. And they were putting out little things on you to get your name familiar, to make you useful for them. They were trying to get their stars publicity and any bad publicity to cover up, which they did very effectively. Set something up. Uh, him and some starlet picnic, soda pop. Already arranged. The studio system of the 1950s was more than just in a state of flux and more than just in a state of decline. It was in a state of radical change. You on the contract? I was at Warner's. But now you're not. Now, no, no. Tough game. The studios were divested by law of their ownership of theaters, so they no longer had a guaranteed outlet for their product, and the studios began letting go their contract players and their, their stable. And as they got rid of their stable, the actors' stability disappeared as well. 
The business is changing. Hmm. Fags and television. The movies were scared to death of television. In fact, say a producer had a TV set in his office, he'd be kicked out of the studio. You weren't allowed to even watch TV on, on studio property. George it was a crossover of real, genuine, groomed for stardom, old Hollywood movie star. And he couldn't get work for a moment in time. And television came along, and this was an embarrassment to him. It was considered really second rate, and so here Reeves, who wanted nothing more than to be a movie star, was stuck in television. I will be on television in a month, wearing brown and gray underpants. Well, hooray! You know, he took the job at, on, on Superman just because he didn't think anyone would ever see it, and it didn't matter, and would go away, and no one watched television. In your chosen career, and all you can do is dress up in tights and a cape and, and with a big S on your chest, you know. And so, it's not much of a career, is it, really, if you've, if you've got talent. And there was very little crossover, very little crossover. It was kind of like, he's the television actor and <laughs> here's the feature actor and so forth. So, it, it, there was a stigma of sorts. Kellogg's has ordered 26 more. They want to film in color. Well. I'll get to wear the blue and red. Now, of course, actors are all, uh, they do what they want, one place here, one place there. It's completely up to them. Salaries are obviously insane now compared to what they were. You have a large corporations, which the motion picture company, one company, is a part of that large corporation. They, they deal in many things. Therefore, you've got more checks and balances. It does mean that it's more than just the studio chief who says, I like it. We're going to shoot it. And what have we? The last of the Mohicans. That was a UA picture, Eddie. There are fewer films being produced. There's less work. There's more uncertainty. All of this means that uh, the studio system, as one might have known it, is long gone. Times have changed because there's so many media now. You know, there's television, there's theater. There's, there's film, there's, and people all over the world are making films. Directors now tend to have more independence. In the case of a director like myself, it, it probably worked to my advantage because I got to work with this, you know, with Focus, this wonderful company that let me do what I wanted to do. I, I would never have had that freedom in the old Hollywood system. I just wouldn't have.